let's hear from our presenters today. Thanks, Jess. Appreciate it. So folks, we're talking today about climate resilience and in particular about resilient ecosystems and the lands and waters they're made of. And at the heart of ecosystem resilience is the idea of function. And functioning ecosystems are diverse and connected ecosystems. Um, we might sometimes call them healthy ecosystems, and those are the ones that really support life. Um, those ecosystems um, can take a, a, a lick and keep on ticking because of their diversity and their connectivity. So think um, hydrologic connections, nutrient connections, habitat connections, um, species connections. When lands and waters are connected, ecosystems are more resilient. But here in the Bay Area, as we all know, our ecosystems have experienced and are experiencing stressors to their inherent resilience from land and water use by humans, the proliferation of non-native invasive species, pollution, and of course, climate change. Uh, climate change is responsible for drying out um, our ecosystems and also um, an increase of damaging extreme weather. So building ecosystem, ecosystem resilience has taken and is going to take thousands of acts of healing. And those acts of healing are going to come in many shapes and sizes. And so to give us all a sense for what those acts of healing look like on the ground, we're joined today by practitioners from three Together Bay Area member organizations. Um, and I'm gonna invite the first speaker in a moment, but just a quick note that as we go, we would love for you to post your questions in the chat and then we'll address them in the Q&A after the presentation. So don't be shy, go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll, we'll, um, we'll track them. So first, we're going to hear about the role of good fire and in and the, in the the role that good fire plays in forest resilience. We're going to hear from Nadia Hamey, who is um, a truly inspiring registered professional forester, um, and is a consultant to the partner organizations who own and manage San Vicente Redwoods, which includes the Peninsula Open Space Trust, Semper Virens Fund. Save the Redwoods League and the Land, Tr Land Trust of Santa Cruz County. Um, and for geography nerds out there like me, San Vicente Redwoods is in Santa Cruz County. So Nadia, it's truly wonderful to have you here. You um, helped host a wonderful um, uh, field trip to San Vicente Redwoods last month. And I think we all um, fell in love with your approach um, your um, information sharing style. And so we're just so pleased to have you here uh, for a Together Tuesday. So Nadia, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I will share my screen. Uh, hi, I'm Nadia Hamey. I'm a registered professional forester, as Tom mentioned, the owner of Hamey Woods Consulting and the property manager of San Vicente Redwoods. I'm here on behalf of Peninsula Open Space Trust, and Semper Virens Fund, the landowners, and Save the Redwoods League and the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County, their partners. Uh, and together we manage San Vicente Redwoods, a nearly 9,000 acre uh, privately held conservation reserve, and it's co-managed by these four land trusts. The property experienced large scale wildfires last in 1948, 2009, and 2020. And we do a lot of stewardship on this property. And today I'm going to highlight how we're working towards a more fire resilient forest. As we all remember, 2020 was a year that much of California burned, including here in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And the 2020 CZU Lightning Complex fire burned over 86,000 acres, including an expansion of about 40,000 acres in a single night that consumed about half of San Vicente Redwoods. And that part of the fire burned hot and fast and left a long lasting mark on the community and the landscape. And as a forester and resident of Bonnie Dune, it's given me the opportunity to witness the impact of high severity fire on the plant community succession and tree health post fire, as long as, uh, in addition to other uh, developments. Um, the map on the left here shows the fire severity across San Vicente Redwoods with the high severity burn areas in red and low severity burn areas in green. And the pictures here are of the 
plant communities in a high severity burn area uh, before and after fire, and they're changing rapidly. So it's hard to know what the tra tra trajectory of these plant communities will take. Uh, there are extensive dead trees across the landscape where it burned hot, and there's thick growing scrubby underbrush, mostly Ceanothus and Eriodictyon or Yerbasanta that are forming dense stands. They're somewhat impenetrable to get through these days. The low severity burn areas, on the other hand, saw far fewer tree deaths and less alteration of the understory. It's tough with our relatively short lifespans for us to perceive nature temporally in the larger scales that are operating with regard to wildfire. And there's many species present in the seed bank, and they, though they remain hidden for decades, they're still there as a vital member of the plant community, and they must be considered when making management decisions. In one case, we had a species that hadn't been documented in the county for uh, 80 years show itself <laughs> Uh, post-2020 wildfire. The CZU fire burned through various fuel management projects that we had in progress throughout the pro property. Uh, we were re refreshing a variety of fuel breaks with our partners at CAL FIRE and had implemented several small prescribed burns since 2012, including one, our biggest to date at that time, that happened just six months before the CZU wildfire struck. So in uh, February, 2020, there was this 20 acre prescribed burn, the location where the star is on the map. And on the right side of the photo, you can see the footprint of uh, the prescribed burn and it had patchy fire activity during the wildfire versus on the left side of the photo is outside the prescribed burn footprint. And nearly all the trees died in this kind of overstocked forest from that wildfire. This area experienced a real flush of fire following endemic species in years one and two post fire, but now there's a really thick canopy of impenetrable uh, Ceanothus and Yerbasanta growing in that understory. And these conditions are problematic because the combination of the dead standing trees and thick understory vegetation creates a tinderbox for the next wildfire. You can come check this area out. Uh, it's next to a uh, public access trail system off of Empire Grade Road. And we actually just re-burned uh, 30 acres of this prescribed burn footprint on Sunday, thanks to CAL FIRE. We see patterns elsewhere on the property that help us understand these fire dynamics. Back in 2009 Lockheed Fire that started northwest of the property, CAL FIRE used this north-south uh, trending ridgeline road to start backing fires and successfully prevent the wildfire from spreading into Bonnie Dune. In the footprint of that wildfire in the 11 years uh, before it burned again, uh, we saw many uh, dead trees left in place and the fire following understory grew in. 11 years later, when that area did burn in the wildfire in 2020, it was heavily impacted. Uh, the fire severity was much higher than some of the surrounding areas. Uh, which suggests that the fire following vegetation can increase the intensity of a later fire. And we're using this information to inform our next steps. It's clear from the vegetation plant communities at San Vicente Redwoods that the ecosystem is really adapted to fire. An examination of the plant communities like uh, the oak woodland shown here is uh, that there are many species that reflect a long history of indigenous and cultural burning in these groves. There are forbs and grasses there that really wouldn't be there without a history of fire. So let's, let's walk through some of the steps of how we're preparing to bring prescribed fire back to the post wildfire environment at San Vicente Redwoods. This is uh, one of our main ridgeline fuel breaks and we're cutting dead trees within the fuel break uh, to help reduce the hazard and make residual trees more likely to live through the next wildfire. We're working towards the goal of reintroducing the prescribed fire there and uh, creating shaded fuel break conditions and retaining live trees to grow into the future shade while removing others to allow for more crown separation and reduction in ladder fuels. We're skidding the large logs that uh, from dead trees out of the fuel break and staging them along roads and landings uh, 
logs that have commercial value, such as redwood and Douglas fir, are being shipped to a sawmill. We are having uh, some innovative products made with oak and madrone, but most is given away as firewood, except that market is pretty saturated. So the rest of the wood is non-merchantable, and we're experimenting with disposal options. For the past year, we've had three air curtain burners and a carbonator on site. And these are incinerators are processing our woody biomass into biochar or ash, and they help reduce the emissions uh, from this processing. The curtain burners in this video are here in, uh, on the north side or the top side in green, and they're being loaded by the excavator. Uh, the carbonator is on the south side of the, or the, the bottom part of the screen, and that machine, uh, require some water through the process to halt uh, burning and create biochar or a, a, a byproduct that is then delivered to an organic farm in Watsonville. Following the log removal, as you can see here, there's a masticator being used to turn slash into mulch, or we use an excavator or hand crews with chainsaws to create uh, burn piles so we could further reduce the, the fuel loading and um, make it an acceptable area for a future prescribed fire. Uh, we're working towards installing a matrix of shaded fuel breaks across the property, sort of for the poor quality of this map, but you can kind of see the myriad projects uh, that are ongoing. Um, we hope to have the ability to bring back fire at scale to influence forest health metrics like biodiversity, tree spacing, fuel loading, and wildlife tree retention and recruitment. We have lots of questions about the fire return intervals and how to track progress, but we plan to continue trying new things and monitoring and tweaking our strategy to try to optimize the results. Uh, lots of planning and progress. To recap, our work at San Vicente Redwoods has shown us a few key takeaways. One, prescribed burning and the prep work associated with it can be a tool for increasing biodiversity, not just fuel reduction. Uh, this is a picture of a red ray sunflower that came up after one of our prescribed burns in 2020. High intensity fires can kill mature trees and encourage vigorous understory regeneration that actually increases fuel loads, whereas lower intensity fires can maintain biodiversity and also reduce fuel loads. And uh, creating shaded fuel breaks is much more efficient and cheaper, safer, and more straightforward before the wildfire strikes. We've definitely got our work cut out for us uh, post wildfire. I want to thank you for your time uh, uh, listening to me talk about a smattering of our fuel management uh, projects at San Vicente Redwoods. And there are many resources available if you're craving more details about what we do. You can check out some of these links or contact myself or, or any of the partner organizations. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Wonderful. Uh, a truly excellent example of how prescribed burning reduced the severity of wildfire and um, how strategies can reduce fuel while increasing biodiversity. I'm sure you're you're just touching the sort of the scratching the, uh, you know, uh, the surface here with all that you could share. So thank you so much for including your contact information. So folks, please reach out to Nadia uh, to continue the conversation. And also, if you're interested in sort of the data side of what you uh, what you saw, please consider um, uh, joining the Together Bay Area's Regional Wildfire Data Working Group. And I just posted a, a link uh, in chat for that. Well, next, we're going to hear uh, about preparing for drought through water recycling uh, in the Bay Area by Florence Weddington, who is a senior civil engineer with the East Bay Municipal Utility District. Florence, thank you so much for being here, and um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, let me share my screen. Uh oh. Oh, there we go. I lost the little button to share my screen, but I found it. 
Perfect. All right, you all can see that, I hope. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that introduction. So I'm just gonna hop right in and um, let me tell you a little bit about East Bay Med. East Bay Med serves um, over 1.4 million customers and our water supply comes from three main sources. 90% of our um, East Bay water comes from the Sierra Nevada, where we have our Party Reservoir and our Comanche Reservoir. And that water is conveyed to the East Bay through um, over 100 miles of pipeline that goes across the Delta. And then it's delivered here to the Bay Area, where we have five local reservoirs and six treatment plants. Approximately 10% of the East Bay water supply is from local runoff. And then in dry years, um, East Bay Mud may tap into water from the Sacramento River using our Freeport water facility. So our strategy, our long-term water supply strategy, it's focused on continuing to build a um, diverse, resilient, and sustainable water supply portfolio. portfolio. And in order to do that, we have um, several different areas that we are looking into. Um, we, we have to plan for uncertainty, you know, for things like climate change and for drought, um, just to make sure we have a um, reliable supply to deliver to our customers. So one of the things that we need to do is we need to protect our current entitlements or our water rights. We also need to continue um, sustainable groundwater management and stewardship. And we do that through um, the development of our East Bay Plain Groundwater Sustainability Plan, and also through our DREAM project that we do with San Joaquin County. And DREAM, it's an acronym for Demonstration, Recharge, Extraction, and Aquifer Management. We also um, maintain our current conservation levels. We have a goal of 70 million gallons of conservation by the year 2050. Um, and so we could look into keeping it at that level or expanding it in the future. And then we also rely on our regional partnerships and water transfer agreements so that we can diversify our supply and improve our regional reliability. So one of the things that we're looking at right now is um, we are looking into the Los Vaqueros expansion project with Contra Costa Water District, as well as many other agencies within the Bay Area. And then we also um, are looking to further expand our recycled water program. So that's the area that I lead at East Bay Med. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about our recycled water program. So it's a great program, but it does come with challenges. Um, and then we've also figured out some successes. One of the things that's challenging is the availability of the recycled water supply um, with water conservation. Um, we've done such a great job with conserving water that there's less wastewater that goes to the wastewater treatment plant that allows us to have supply for recycling. And then also, our treatment plants are not always located close to the customers that need them. So that can be a challenge as well. And I'll talk about that a bit more later. And then also sometimes the cost of the projects is very expensive. So you have to weigh out um, the cost benefit um, to figure out which projects will move forward. But we've also been able to figure out a lot of ways to have success. And we can do that through innovation um, and having regional collaborations and sharing of resources. So our current recycled water program, it consists of five non-potable projects and we have um, a production capacity of 9 million gallons per day, but we have a goal of um, serving 20, millions, 20 million gallons per day by the year 2040. So that means we need um, an additional 11 MGD for future projects. And so far we've spent $145 million to date, plus 
um, we've been able to get state, federal, and private funding for our projects. So from this figure, you can see that um, our recycled water projects, they extend all across our service area. So we have two projects that serve uh, the Richmond um, refinery. We have um, a project that serves our San Ramon Valley um, area. We have a partnership with um, San Leandro so we can provide recycled water in both San Leandro and a couple of customers in Alameda. And then we have um, our East Bay Shore recycled water project that's located at our main wastewater treatment plant that serves um, Emeryville and Oakland currently, but ultimately it will serve Berkeley, Albany, and Alameda. So with our existing projects, I mentioned from our um, prior um, slide that we have our East Bay Shore program, East Bay Shore Recycled Water Project, and it's currently, um, we're doing a pilot study there so we can increase the water quality. With that facility being located so close to the bay, the, um, the wastewater, um, the interceptor pipes, they take in a lot of uh, salt water from the bay because there's um, infiltration of that salt water into the interceptors. And then there's also a high ammonia concentration in the waste um, stream that we are treating. So we're trying to figure out how to make that better so that there's not an um, impact on our irrigation customers during droughts and also um, for our cooling tower customers. And then um, again, the North Richmond and Rare facilities, they serve uh, the Chevron refinery in Richmond. We also have a commercial recycled water fill station and um, it's, a, it's free for our commercial customers. They do have to complete a permit application. And as part of that application process, they need to have proof of liability insurance and workers' comp insur compensation insurance. And then um, they also need an approved tank where they can collect the recycled water and bring it on site. And then they need um, some training. So that's a great program for our commercial customers. And then we're also um, have some potential projects and partnerships that we are doing. Um, we're working with Philip 66 um, to customize an on-site reuse project that will meet their needs. Um, and then we're also working with a, couple, a few customers on um, satellite projects. I'd mentioned before that sometimes the treatment facilities are not located near um, where we would like to deliver recycled water. So there are opportunities where we can put a small package treatment plant at the customer site so that they can um, uh, get recycled water directly and it would only serve the one customer. And then we're also looking at some partnerships with um, Central Contra Costa Sanitary District so we can evaluate some potential collaborations with them to provide recycled water to our customers that are in that wastewater service area. And then we are currently updating our recycled water strategic plan. Um, it's scheduled to be completed in 2024. And as part of that plan, we're gonna review our existing projects to see how we um, may be able to expand those. And we're also looking at future projects so we can see you know, what the best way um, to move forward with the um, with some new projects. And then this um, plan, we are also looking at potable reuse options that we can um, use district-wide. So we, our current program only is for non-potable use. So that's for like um, irrigation, cooling towers, toilet flushing, um, construction, you know, dust um, prevention, things like that. But we're looking at how we can treat the water to a level that is high enough that it can be included in um, our uh, potable program. So those are just some of the things that we have um, coming up that we're looking at as part of our recycled water strategic plan. And um, 
with that, I'm all done. Florence, thank you so much. Gosh, we learned a ton in that 10 minutes about recycled waters portion of the overhaul uh, water resilience strategy and about the supply and demand of recycled water. Um, seems like uh, there's several questions in the in the chat uh, for you when we get to the Q&A, but um, yeah, it certainly seems like every gallon that gets recycled is a gallon that could be used for drinking water for people and reduce demand on the ecosystem, but let's dive more into that in the Q&A. Um, so thank you, Florence. Um, finally, we're going to hear about watershed restoration um, from Kellex Nelson, who's the executive director with San Mateo Resource Conservation District. Uh, Kellex's presentation will focus on her work uh, on, on, on the Resource Conservation District's work in Pescadero Creek Watershed in San Mateo County. Um, and Kellex is joining us from a conference up on the California North Coast. Kellex, thank you so much for um, for you know making this happen, uh, despite being uh, uh, at a conference. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So um, yeah. So is that, are you all able to see my my screen? Yes. Great. Thank you. I'm going to uh, provide a perspective on uh, building resilience by helping people help the land. And I think that I'll start with just making sure that everybody actually knows what an RCD or resource conservation district is. We're, we're a form of local government that's a special district and we were created to do voluntary conservation. So we're non-regulatory and we always work in partnership. We work across public and private lands, across jurisdictions, across boundaries to get conservation done. And we're also an unusual niche in that we're an environmental organization that is centered on people. And so the people who own or manage land, the people who grow our food, the people who run businesses, our communities are how we get conservation accomplished. And fundamentally, we help people help the land um, and we help people by helping the land. And so that's where some of this climate resilience fits in. In San Mateo, our RCD does this in these five program areas, um, forests and wildfire, wildlife, water, climate, and agriculture. And I'll touch briefly on something we're doing in each of those areas. So um, some of you may be familiar with the fact that there's more than 40 species of plants and animals at risk of extinction in San Mateo County. So we work to restore thousands of acres of habitat, um, a couple thousand currently underway in the Pescadero Creek watershed alone. And this is done with many partners, some that you would consider your typical conservation partners and some that you might not consider a typical conservation partner, but they're all part of the equation. Things like removing dams, opening up over a hundred miles of creek habitat for salmon and steelhead to migrate and spawn, restoring wetlands, um, et cetera, forest health projects, et cetera. Also, we are always preparing for drought and water security, kind of like Florence was describing. Um, we help to ensure reliable water for farms, fish, and people who need it. As, um, as you all know, our region has no snowpack. And the Pescadero watershed, specifically in much of the San Mateo County coast, has no water utility, no irrigation district, no municipal reservoir, no intertie with a state water project. Everybody is just putting their straw in the creek um, for whether it's for um, drinking water or for farms. And of course, that is really needed for the wildlife that's in the creek. Sorry about that. Um, so we help people conserve, strategically manage, and store water to simultaneously provide water security and improve the stream flow in the creek for things like that connectivity Tom mentioned in his um, in his uh, introduction for migration corridors. On the screen right now, you can see both agricultural and domestic uh, projects. And we see working lands as essential in building climate resilience and farmers and ranchers as environmental stewards and partners. So one of our programs is to help them quote unquote farm carbon. We work with them to develop site specific comprehensive plans to store carbon in healthy soils and native vegetation. And it has all sorts of co-benefits for drought resilience, increased water holding capacity of the soil, 
um, improved base flows in, a, in creeks in the watershed, improved habitat, improved um, uh, reduced erosion, and more. This photo on the top left is uh, an example. This is this shows the plan that we developed for Tomcat Ranch and Pescadero, mapping out site-specific conservation practices that actually work for the ranch operation. Oh, and we just lost power. It was a good call that I was set up with my phone as the hotspot. I called it. Um, so uh, this slide is a um, little bit more directly about climate change. We know that, that climate change poses many often contradictory threats, right? We're working on resilience to drought and flooding and fire all at the same time, sometimes having meetings about those same things in the same day. Um, so some of our efforts are focused purely on community protection, like the CHIPPER program, um, on the left, this photo that you see that helps create defensible spaces around homes. Others are focused on ecosystem restoration that has co-benefits for reducing risks and hazards. When ecosystems are disrupted, it can create or worsen hazards. And often when we restore ecosystem function or habitats, it reduces those hazards. So on the top right, you see when, um, when a creek is reconnected to a floodplain, from which it had become disconnected, it give, it takes pressure off the system and gives water plate and sediment places to flow, reducing downstream flooding, perhaps in places where it would cause more harm. And the, the image on the bottom shows the, the dredge project that we did years ago in Pescadero Marsh across state and county and private properties that removed sediment that had filled Butteau Creek when we removed that sediment, it simultaneously reduced the flooding impacts to the community and restored migration for coho salmon who had been completely extirpated from that, that part of the system, from Butteau Creek. And furthermore, beneficially reusing that sediment on site to mitigate other former human impacts and that improved water quality and stopped the annual mortality events of threatened and endangered fish species, steelhead in particular in, in the marsh. And despite our best efforts, um, these disasters do occur and have occurred. These top two photos um, really show impacts from those 2020 fires that Nadia referenced. And the bottom two photos show impacts that happened in the storms last January. And the top right photo is just one, it was, it was very difficult to choose what to share um, in this time, is where those come together. There's a number of times where the fire exacerbated conditions or worsened conditions that made them more vulnerable to the storms. And so we provide assistance to help heal the land when these disasters occur, and also to help manage natural resources to reduce further risk. And um, yeah, that's good for that. And so what does this look like at scale? So property by property across these public and private lands, across conservation lands and working lands and roads and culverts in the built environment, doing really diverse kinds of projects, we can develop resilience. And in Pescadero Watershed is but one example of the kinds of work I, you see um, uh, this photo on the top is a before and after picture of a dam removal project. Um, and um, and on the, the bottom photo is a before, I should have put it an after project of repairing land. This is uh, the type of erosion that happened in one storm event. And, um, and building soil health, managing our watershed, um, hy hydrology, et cetera, can help build overall resilience from top to bottom of the watershed for all these benefits that you see on the side. And that is an overview of how oh, we're doing some of that. Thank you. Alex, thank you. Um, what a, a incredible suite of examples of what multi-benefit projects look like and what it takes to uh, restore ecosystem health. Um, Annie, you've been tracking questions. Will you join me on the stage to uh, moderate questions for our speakers? I'd be happy to. Um, there's some, there's might be more questions than we can get to uh, today. So um, keep the questions coming. And uh, one of the things that we'll do is share contact information of our speakers. And I hope that you'll follow up with them directly for some of the more specific questions or just to, to build more connections. Um, again, one of our goals for today is regional coordination. So 
um, that's what we're hoping to, to facilitate. Um, uh, one question I wanna ask uh, for you, Florence, and then I have a question for all three of you. Um, Florence, uh, there's some questions in the chat around water quality and how the recycled water is used. Uh, could you talk about um, how, what the science is telling us about the use of recycled water for ecosystem restoration, agriculture, and groundwater recharge through percolation? And that question comes from Andrea McKenzie. Okay, um, thank you for that question. Um, so there's, um, I guess the the water, depending on what the use is, will depend on the level of treatment that is needed um, for the recycled water. So for like basic irrigation, you know, we file, follow Title 22 um, regulations um, and that gets us to a certain level where it's safe for irrigation and also for some other uses like cooling towers where there's no, um, you know, public contact with the water. So the water is very safe at that tertiary level. But then we also, like if we want to um, inject it into the groundwater, the state also has regulations that um, are, that cover like what level of treatment is needed to that before it can be injected into a groundwater source. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then if we're, what we're looking at now is, you know, going one step further with potable reuse options. And so the state is planning to have regulations available um, at the end of this year, by the end of December, that will regulate um, whether or not you can put that water into like a water body that is then it's pulled out and treated and then um, into the distribution system, or it could be treated to a level where it can go directly into the distribution system. But the science definitely tells us that the, the, um, the recycled water is safe. Mm -hmm. um, and then it is being used already for groundwater recharge in portions of the state and for ag use, Sacramento, um, is doing a big agricultural project right now called their harvest. Um, I forget the actual name, but they're starting a project where they're providing recycled water, millions of gallons per day to the Central Valley for irrigation. So it's very safe. Thank you so much for that answer. I hear science. I hear a lot of regulation. Mm -hmm. um, and also I'm thinking that at this, um, I have not yet heard of anyone uh, making new water. Um, so uh, in some sense, all of the water we're in contact with is recycled. I mean, it's it's part of one system, right? Um, there's, there's no new water. Um, right. uh, so there's a lot of science, a lot of regulation. And um, so thank you for that question. And thank you for that answer. Um, all three of you talked about, um, all three of you used the words figuring it out. Um, uh, and I'm curious if we could hang out with that and, and, and talk about what it means to figure it out, um, both in terms of you know, science and exploration and innovation, also in terms of how you're working with others to figure it out, whether it's research entities or partner organizations or um, the land itself, the water itself, helping you figure it out. Um, uh, Nadia, I wonder if we could start with you and then Calix and then Florence about to talk about um, some of the, the the fun and some of the challenges of of what it means to figure it out. There's so many frontiers for that in my <laughs> career right now. Um, you know, I, I mentioned a little bit the trajectory of the um, succession of plant species. It's just kind of unknown. Um, to most people that I work with and talk to, you know, uh, how exactly it will evolve. And so I stay really plugged in to my hero, uh, Dylan Neubauer, who's a botanist I work with, uh, and just really trying to sponge from her observations of um, the really uh, nuanced uh, changes in the plant community. Uh, and we really need to get out to the key places immediately following the fire um, to look for uh, 
the fire following species because as one, one thing we've observed here three years out is they're very fleeting. So, um, you know, we'll have potentially a, a spike in um, fire following species that will be gone uh, mm -hmm. within three years uh, mm -hmm. post fire. So we need to be very observant and do as much documentation of that uh, evolution as possible to, to convey to others. And uh, I have also been in a completely different vein, really plugged into and, and trying to do a study on uh, defect long-term in redwood from different severity wildfires. Mm -hmm. So observing those trees and trying to make a field guide for foresters and talking to other foresters and talking to people who are milling that wood about how, uh, you know, sound boards can be made from different uh, burn severity trees and that informs you know the um potential motivation to do salvage logging uh post fire which is a, a big consideration that's great go on and on but i'll stop it's a really <laughs> a rich uh time to be in this field that's well said it's a it is a rich time to be doing the work that we're doing and to be alive doing uh, in this moment in time. Yeah. Calix, what can you talk about how you and your partners um, are figuring it out? Yeah. Um, I'm pleased to say that the number of times that um, a design challenge or an engineering uh, challenge was a barrier to getting a project done, the number of times that happened is zero. The challenge is the resources to do the planning. Mm -hmm. and to do the collaborating and to have collaborative capacity to do things at a landscape scale and what have you. One of the things that I appreciate about Together Bay Area and many of the people on this call is um, the partnering to try to access some of those resources. Mm -hmm. um, I think a challenge for us is that, um, you know, that it is so hard and complex to get these projects done. You have to line up, the window has to line up of when your fun funding is available, when your permits will let you work, when you can get contractors, when maybe a farmer isn't harvesting or you know when there's operational considerations, when a landowner is willing and you have to have a magic wand to make all of those like line up for one sweet spot. And then, um, then you hope that the funding is gonna be flexible for the realities and that permitting will be flexible for the realities that occur when you're restoring dynamism on a dynamic landscape. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so funding and permits typically are oriented towards wanting certainty to outcomes. And when we're in uncertain times and what we're trying to restore is dynamism to build resilience, then we need to use these tools differently. And so I think that that's a big conversation that we need to be having moving forward about how to figure it out. That's great. I'm going to practice saying Diamond, diamond, die. Dynamism. <laughs> It'll come. It'll come, right? <laughs> uh, Florence, what about you? Um, can you tell us a little bit about how East Bay Mud, how you and your team, as well as your the agencies, um, kind of learning and trying and figuring it out? Yeah, it's. Um, I think. Well, I'll just start by saying our main goal at East Bay Mud is to make sure that we have a reliable water supply for mm -hmm. all of our you know, over 1.4 million customers. And so it can be a juggling act when you're looking at, you know, if you have multiple year droughts, you know, where is your water supply going to come from? Um, and with climate change, some of the things that we've relied on in the past, you know, may not be available to us in the, fu in the future at the, you know, level that we are anticipating. So that's kind of where the recycled water part comes in. Mm -hmm. We're trying to, you know, use the right water for the right, um, right project or right, you know, use. And so, you know, some of our projects, and this is what we're looking at in our strategic plan. Some of our projects are super successful. We have more demand there and there is supply. So we're looking at how can we get more supply? So we've partnered with other agencies to, I'll use our San Ramon project, for example, you know, we have a moratorium on connections because we can't connect any more customers because we don't have enough supply. So we had a 
it's a temporary agreement for five years where we're working with another wastewater agency, Central Contra Costa Sanitary District, to divert part of their wastewater to our treatment mm -hmm. plant mm -hmm. so that we have more supply to serve our customers. So that's one of the things that we're figuring out. And then we're also looking at, like I said, how we can use recycled water as a potential potable source of water. And so the big thing there is, you know, it's expensive um, and we need to figure out funding or, you know, we, we try to do everything so that we don't have to raise rates because we, for some people, it's a hardship. So we need to figure out, you know, how much we want to raise rates to keep that reliability and are there other ways to do it? So there's, I don't want to take up too much time, but there's just a lot of things that we have to look at. We want to make sure that the water supply that we are sending out, that uh, we make sure it's equitable. So everybody's getting the same quality of water and there are no issues where people feel um, slighted or privileged because of the water that they're getting. So we need to figure out how that plays into, you know, the bigger picture. So lots of things to consider and we're, we're figuring it out. <laughs> I hear a whole lot of complexity um, in all three of your presentations. Uh, I also hear the need for more, more funding, more people, uh, more science, more, um, you know, that the that there's a lot of good energy that's happening. There's a lot of good work that's happening and, and we need to do more. I also saw a question, which we don't have time to get to yet, but how do we scale? How do we expand? How do we um, do more faster, but also more uh, durably? so that um, these changes that we're trying to influence on the on a very, to your point, Kellex, a, a living system. Um, you know, we're not, we're not building new pens. Uh, we're, we're, create, we're working within living systems. Um, so how do we do more of that with the uncertainty that we're, we're living in? Um, I, I'd like to talk for another hour or so with the three of you. And unfortunately we don't have that hour, um, uh, but please everybody join me in thanking Florence, Kellex, and Nadia for joining us today. Um, these are three projects that are happening on the local scale by Together Bay Area members. And now we're gonna get in a helicopter and go up to the state level scale for our next speaker. Um, but please let's first acknowledge their, their contributions to today's event. Um, really thank you all three of you for being here. Yes, indeed, thank you. And thank you, Tom, for facilitating. Um, uh, I'd like to, uh, talk quickly about how Together Bay Area links the, the local to the regional to the state. Um, one is that we're really actively uh, advocating with our members for more funding and building on what was just shared um, in that we need to increase the pace and the scale of the work that's happening and all the different kinds of projects that were just described and so many more. Um, and that we are fortunate in the Bay Area to have a funding, a state partner, a state agency partner that can uh, can um, has the technical assistance, technical capacity, and if we're successful, the funding uh, to support all the different kinds of projects that we heard. And that's the state coastal conservancy and specifically in the nine counties of the Bay Area, the Bay program. Um, and our advocacy program is really focused on that. Um, we're also, as Tom mentioned earlier, uh, convening a working group around data that's used before, during, and after wildfires. Um, and our right relations program is absolutely a part of our work for climate resilience. Um, so we're doing a bunch of different things um, at the regional scale. And, and now I want to welcome um, somebody from the state level um, to the stage. Uh, I want to welcome Amanda Hansen. Uh, she joined the California Natural Resources Agency in, in 2019, which is a better year than 2020 to start a new job. Um, as the, the agency's Deputy Secretary for Climate Change. And if there's ever a job title that is both inspiring and maybe a little terrifying, it is to be the Deputy Secretary for Climate Change. Um, uh, in this role, she drives the agency's efforts to build California's resilience to climate impacts and accelerate the contribution of nature-based solutions, which we've just been hearing a lot about, uh, to meeting climate goals. Um, and she also coordinates the the agency's national and international climate engagement, a huge job. So welcome, Amanda, really glad that you're here. Um, let's just start with one of the things that you work on, the Natural and Working Lands Climate Smart Strategy. Can you 
tell us what that is um, and, and maybe connect it to some of the things that we've just been hearing. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for having me, Annie and team, and thanks to everyone for taking time to, to join today. Um, please, if, if anybody just does not needs me to stop and pause to clarify anything, just interrupt me, please. I will. Um, so <laughs> so um, I'll just take one step back from the strategy to say that uh, in 2020, the governor issued an executive order that essentially said, we need to do way more to accelerate our pace and scale for nature-based solutions that address the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. This is a very important pillar of our um, climate and biodiversity work. And so we wanna see more of it. And it essentially tasked a lot of different agencies with doing a lot of different things to help do that scaling. One of those, um, agency sort of assignments was, hey, we don't actually have a strategy for how nature-based solutions can deliver on our climate goals. We have them for short-lived climate pollutants. We have them for clean energy rollout. We have them for electric vehicle um, growth. We, we don't have one for nature-based solutions. So let's build out a strategy and then let's execute on it. So this was the first time that we've ever taken all of the different pieces of our nature-based solutions work, which exist in a lot of sort of um, landscape specific um, work streams. So for example, we have the Forest and Wildfire Resilience Task Force, and they do incredible work to support forest health. Um, and a lot of the work that they're calling for are nature-based solutions, whether it's um, you know, doing increasing prescribed burning, which we heard a lot about this morning, creating fuel breaks, which we heard about this morning, um, you know, figuring out, um, you know, how it is that we track our progress, et cetera. Those are all in the nature-based solutions space. We have our Ocean Protection Council. They have a strategic plan for protecting California's coast. A lot of what they're calling for in that strategic plan are nature-based solutions, restoring wetlands, restoring seagrasses, um, you know, conservation across all of these different landscapes. And so really what we tried to do with this natural working lands climate smart strategy was to take all of the things that we we're already doing that we're already committed to mm. and put them in one place. And then for the places for the for the you know landscapes where we might not have a lot of work that we're doing, make sure that we start doing more work in those in those places and understanding actually we do a, a ton of work here but we don't think about it as a climate benefit. We think about it for some other reason, right? Um, Cause there's lots of benefits to these nature-based solutions, whether it's, you know, protecting species or increasing, uh, uh, um, I'm gonna mess up the words because I'm not a water expert, but, um, you know, allowing water to be maintained in the soils and not just slip off and get lost. Um, Someone else here knows the answer to that that I do, so I apologize. Um, you know, there's uh, reduced air pollution for some of these nature-based solutions. So, um, in some in some cases, it just took like a little shifting of perspective to understand that oh yeah, this work totally actually also delivers on climate. So the strategy outlines specific landscapes in California. We had to organize them around the way that the um, um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is like the global climate science premier group, um, the way that they do measurement of carbon on landscapes, just so that when we do our measurements, it can align with the international community, the way that the international community measures their their carbon. Um, it was controversial because, you know, in California, to just sort of roll up all forests and just call them all forests, everyone was like, oh, can't do that. You know, it's and, and we understand why they're not all the same. There's a lot of differences, et cetera, but um, you know, we're, we're just trying to be consistent with, with um, international scientific community. Um, so we rolled up all of our landscapes into eight different types. And then we, in the strategy, essentially identified what are priority nature-based solutions that we know deliver climate benefit. And I just wanna be super clear. When we talk about climate benefits, we're talking about absolutely reducing risks and building long-term resilience. Mm -hmm. We're also talking about the way that a lot of these nature-based solutions can deliver on our commitment to carbon neutrality and net zero. 
So not every single nature-based solution does, but many do. Um, and so we want to make sure that wherever these solutions are delivering on both, that you know we want to be clear about that. Mm -hmm. um, so we we talk about we identify what these priority nature-based solutions are, and then we go through and summarize how do they deliver on building a more resilient natural system um, given future climate impacts that we know are coming. How do they support um, you know? protecting communities from climate impacts? Mm -hmm. um, how do they avoid future emissions? How do they sequester or store carbon? So we try to go into some level of detail around like the specific climate benefits that these mm -hmm. practices produce. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, when we're done talking, I'll put a link in the chat. To, I meant to do that beforehand, but I can't multitask. Um, uh, I'll put a link in the chat to the strategy so folks can check it out. Um, we're actually getting ready to update the strategy next year. Uh, it was a, a, a major bill was signed by the governor last year um, as part of his climate package of, of climate legislation. Um, and I'll just sort of tease that in addition to calling for the update of that strategy, that bill also calls on California to set targets for nature-based solutions. And we're very close to wrapping that process up. I hope um, you know, we've we've built out. Uh, we had a very significant public comment period earlier this year. Mm -hmm. We had an expert advisory committee that that came and gave us their recommendations for these targets. So really excited to to get those out. And um, Annie, that you know your your comment about getting you know sort of more resources and more focus. I I think this is going to be an important step. We've done that target setting in a lot of other sectors. So excited to do it for nature too. That's fantastic. Uh, I also, I hear the complexity in what you just described too. I mean, it's a large, we're, we live in a large state where with uh, redwood forests and deserts and high Sierra and coasts. And it's just, uh, it's what makes California such a special place and such an important place to conserve for biodiversity. Um, and it's also really complex to like uh, summarize it or simplify it at the state level scale. So um, thank you and all of your colleagues for for working on that. Um, I have a lot of empathy for that <laughs> for that work. Um, <laughs> um, I'm curious how. Uh, well, two questions. Um, uh, one is how does regional coordination fit in? You talked about how there's different differences across the state in terms of the responses and the and the kind of human systems that are working on these things. So I'm curious about regional coordination and also how can people get involved in, in the work that you're doing? Um, uh, we'd love to learn more, you know, for the folks that are watch, here now and are watching this later, uh, what can they do? Well, um, I'll maybe I'll start with your first question and then go to the second. So, you know, the, the, the interesting thing about Climate Smart land management is it's yes we we are setting targets um as we've done in other sectors but we have a different set of tools than we do in other sectors to get there and so you know we're not going to go through like an air resources board regulatory process um to phase out a certain kind of a light bulb like it's it's just not the same mm, right type of sector and just like you were saying we're dealing with natural like dynamic living systems. Yeah. Um, so, you know, our goal when we set out this statewide strategy was to be as clear as we possibly could that we very much understand that when you're when you're executing on one of these priority nature-based solutions, that you're gonna need to do so in a way that is locally or regionally appropriate. And that was one of the hardest things for us to do was to like address that tension between, you can't have it be so specific that it's actually not really relevant to many, many different, you know, um, yeah. local, regional uh, places within that big landscape. But you also can't have it be so high level that it's not actually gonna deliver a climate benefit that's credible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I what you see in this, what you see in this first strategy is our attempt um, to really get that balancing act right. So I think, you know, where we really, we, 
sort of get to your second question, um, what can you do? I mean, I think the work that you're doing, the work that I just heard be um, outlined mm -hmm. is very much driving on California's nature-based solutions mm -hmm. agenda. And I think, um, you know, we're, we're going to be counting on the expertise that lives in on the ground in local and regional areas to understand that's nice state, but we need to do things a little bit differently here because of X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. It still delivers benefit. And so I think that's just um, something that I want to just convey that we understand that there's a tension there and want to be as flexible as possible. Yeah. Um, you know, we're, once we release these targets, we're on the hook to show progress and to report on progress. And mm -hmm. so I think something that we're going to be turning to is to understand how can we work with leaders such as yourselves, but around the state mm -hmm. to, um, you know, get the word out about these targets, to increase excitement and ambition and interest in helping to deliver on the targets, because they're not they're not just intended for the state, you know, state agencies to, to make happen. It's going to take all of us. They're collective targets. Um, and then to also think about ways that we might partner to report on our progress. Um, you know, it would be really awesome to showcase some of the work that's being done, really innovative and um, uh, meaningful work that's getting done around California as we do our reporting so that people can see how their work is being reflected in the bigger picture for, uh, statewide climate agenda that we're trying to um, push forward. Yeah, that's great. Uh, um, you can count on us, uh, both together Bay Area and our members to to support you in that work. Um, you know, I, I, I see a lot of the work that you're doing and your colleagues at um, CNRA is really, um, is uh, talked about it before, like creating that tailwind so that we can do more work at the local scale. Um, and uh, thank you for acknowledging that tension of um, the, the importance of the local and the importance of the state. Like we need, thank you for the leadership that the state is and the governors is, is providing because they really are very complimentary. And in the details, there's a lot of tensions that we have to work, work through together. Um, this may be a, um, an impossible question, but do you have a sense of the timeline of when the updates and the, the next iteration will be released? So the targets, the targets are due January 1st, 2024, and they will be released by then. Um, the updated natural working lands climate smart strategy, that is um, going to kick off. We're going to kick off the process of updating that in quarter one next year. We will release a draft um, at some point. I'm actually just in the process of like building out the roadmap. Um, but it is due based on the legislation. It's due January first, twenty twenty-five. And by the way, everyone, if we're all working on bills, let's try to lay off the January one timelines. They're very brutal. I can't believe. I'm like, why do I have so many January one deadlines? It's painful. Um, but that's that's our our deadline for the updated strategy. So, like a, a May first would be a preferable deadline, maybe not, or a June first, just not yeah. January first. January first, yeah, yeah. just no interrupt time. <laughs> Jess, you got that. Take that down. Yeah, yeah. I I appreciate that. Well, um, thank you so much for being here and joining us today. Thank you for listening to our uh, the projects that we uh, heard from earlier. Um, and really, Amanda, thank you for your leadership. Um, it's it's a complicated uh, task that you have. Um, and as you've heard, Together Bay Area members are really working on multiple um, multiple solutions to the multidimensional and multi-benefit uh, situations that we're all working within. And um, just really grateful for your leadership. And please consider us a resource and a partner to you as, as you continue to move forward. Um, please join me, everybody, in thanking Amanda and, and welcoming, uh, yeah. thanking her for her time and for her leadership. Um, as we wrap up today, um, I just want to, uh, again, thank everybody for being here. Thank you for our, to our speakers for joining us and sharing their the information and their stories, their wisdom. Um, and also want to thank all of the Together Bay Area members that are here today. Um, really, this, this coalition and this events like this and a lot of the work that we do doesn't happen without our members 
uh, contributions and participation. So um, my thanks to all of you. And if you wanna learn more about um, who we are and what we do and how our members um, contribute and participate in this regional coalition, um, there is a link in the chat for you. Um, and if you would like to talk more, if you have questions, please reach out to me or Laura or Jess or Tom. We'd be happy to talk to you about uh, the work that Together Bay Area is doing um, to coordinate regionally um, to advance, uh, you know, habitat, regional habitat goal setting, uh, to build regional tribal alliances, um, and to advocate for more funding uh, for the region to advance the work, some of the like, work like we heard today and, and so much more. So um, with that, uh, we will be stick around for a few minutes just to see if anybody has any questions. Um, otherwise, um, enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Um, let's hope for, for rain coming, um, I, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, um, and that we get our, a, a, good, a good, good rain, good storm coming soon. Um, thank you all for coming, and, and, and we'll see you next time.